just for people's information, the proceedings will be uh, transmitted on, uh, as far as I know, on the uh, UPC channel 207. So just uh, I suppose to make, make that clear. So it's very important that people turn off their mobile phones, OK? Uh, everybody here, because we don't want any interference with the recording uh, equipment. And also, the, obviously, the people are quiet for the speakers as well. All right. Um, OK, so I'm, I have to, uh, first of all, I want to um, get, just speak to you about the privilege and give you uh, information about that and draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this, to this committee. However, if they are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter um, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are also directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her or it identifiable. I also wish to advise you that the opening statements you have submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. Uh, members are likewise reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice which I have just outlined. Um, now, with the matter we are looking at today is the Gender Recognition Bill 2013 General Scheme. The general, general scheme of the Gender Recognition Bill was published in July last by the Minister for Social Protection, Joan Burton TD, following Cabinet approval and was referred to the Committee for its consideration. In order to assist the Committee to consider the proposed legislation, the Committee sought the views of interested individuals and organisations and ten written submissions were received. To enable the Committee to develop its understanding of the key issues identified in this process, the Committee decided to hear evidence from key individuals and groups on the matter. Now, we couldn't obviously bring everybody in, but we, we, we brought organisations and individuals which, uh, you know, uh, who have a, a long-standing expertise in the area. And in the first of the hearings, which is today, uh, we will hear from the Department of Social Protection, uh, uh, the Transgender Equality Network Ireland, Transparency C, uh, belong to LGBT Noise and Professor Donal O'Shea. And tomorrow we will have a similar uh, arrangement where we will have six witnesses um, and the meeting starts at 10. And I suppose in terms of like, we won't be able to do all the business today. We have to make it over the two days and we have to be fair, fair in, the, in the sense of uh, the people who are coming here tomorrow as well. And what I was going to say is that I would like to aim to finish the meeting at half three. Uh, because that's the slot of time we have the room available for and um, I'm going to ask people to keep to the time limits and uh, uh, just to say as well at this stage that at two o'clock so the senators may have to leave because the, the Taoiseach is addressing the Shannad uh, today so like um, just to explain that as well uh, but obviously over the two hearings like we'll be hearing from the senators as well. All right so um, <coughs> Okay, our first speaker. Okay, I'm now going to um, I'm, I'm now going to invite the first speaker uh, in the order that we decided as a committee. Uh, it's uh, Sim Simonetta Ryan who's going to make the presentation on behalf of the Department of Social Protection. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I thank the chairs and members for the opportunity to attend before the Joint Committee on Education and Social Protection to brief you on the general scheme of the Gender Recognition Bill 2013. This is a very important piece of legislation to provide for the solemn recognition by the state of a person's acquired gender for all purposes. As you will see in the course of my presentation, the provisions in the bill contain some very significant advances on previous proposals, particularly in relation to the validation process. In summary, the provisions in the bill seek to be respectful to all concerned, to be prudent, to be practical, and to preserve the integrity of state records. This presentation will set out the background to the preparation of the legislation, outline the purpose of the bill and summarise the bill's provisions. The background. The lack of legal uh, recognition for transgender persons is a significant and long-standing issue. The High Court declared in 2008 that the state was in breach of its obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights because it did not have a process to legally recognise the acquired gender of, of transgender persons. The Interdepartmental Gender Recognition Advisory Group, GRAG, was established in 2010 to advise on the legislation required to give legal recognition to the acquired gender of transgender persons. There is a commitment in the, in the programme for government that transgender people will be provided with legal recognition. 
In July 2011, the report with the GRAG was published and the government decided that legislation would be drafted in line with its recommendations. Since then, and building on this report, the Department of Social Protection has engaged in a significant amount of consultation and research during the preparation of the legislation. We have sought and considered the views of a range of organisations and individuals who have experience and expertise in this area, including transgender persons and their representative organisations. While the Bill is in keeping with the general structure of the GRAG recommendations, it differs in a number of key aspects which I, which I will explain later. The purpose of the Bill. Following government approval, the, gen, the general scheme of the Gender Recognition Bill was published on the 17th of July 2013. This legislation will give legal recognition to the acquired gender of transgender persons, formal legal recognition through the issuing of a gender recognition certificate by the Department of Social Protection will mean that the person's acquired gender will be fully recognised by the state for all purposes, including the right to marry or to enter a civil partnership in the acquired gender and the right to a new birth certificate. The legislation will allow for applications from people with intersex conditions should they wish to apply. The main effects of the legislation for those wishing to have their gender recognised are as follows. The bill will provide for persons aged 18 and over and who are not married or in a civil partnership. The person will be officially legally recognised by the state as being of the acquired gender from the date of the decision to issue the gender recognition certificate. The recognition will be for all purposes, including dealings with the state, public bodies and civil and commercial society. The person whose acquired gender is recognised will be entitled to marry a person of the opposite gender or enter a civil partnership with a person of the same gender. The decision will entitle persons <coughs> whose births are registered in Ireland to a new birth certificate that shows the acquired gender and new names if names are also changed. Similarly, for those whose births are registered in the Foreign Birth Register, maintained by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the decision will entitle them to a new Foreign Birth Registration Certificate that shows the new gender and new names if names are also changed. All rights, responsibilities and consequences of actions by the person in their original gender prior to the date of recognition will remain unaffected. I would now like to summarise the main provisions of the Bill. Heads 1 to 3 are standard provisions dealing with the short title of the Act, commencement orders, definitions of terms used in the Act and the power of the Minister to make regulations and to give effect to the Act. Head 4 provides that the Minister for so Social Protection shall be the decision-making authority in relation to granting approval for gender recognition certificates. The Minister shall issue the certificate once the application meets all the qualification requirements. Head 5 sets out the conditions that a person is required to meet in order to qualify for a gender recognition certificate. The person must meet one of the following three criteria. Their birth is registered in Ireland. They have become an Irish citizen by having their birth registered in the foreign births registered maintained by the Minister for Foreign Affairs or Trade. And they are ordinarily resident in the state. They must also be at least 18 years of age on the date of the application. And they must not be in an existing marriage or civil partnership. In addition, they must meet the evidential requirements set out in Head 6. In respect of the age limit, the government, following consideration, decided that a minimum age of 18 should apply. This is based on the recommendations made in the GRAG report. The requirement that applicants for gender recognition but not, must not be in an existing marriage or civil partnership was also considered by government, and it was decided that due to the constitutional context, this current legislation could apply only to persons not in an existing marriage or civil partnership. Head 6 addresses the evidence which must, must be supplied by the applicant to demonstrate that he or she meets the qualification requirements. This includes a certificate from the Register of Births or from the Foreign Births Register, proof of ordinary residence in Ireland, and a proof of identity in a form to be prescribed by the Minister. The Gregg report had proposed that the person seeking recognition of their required gender would be required to make an application to a specially established expert panel or gender recognition panel, which would examine the evidence and make a decision on each application. Even in the couple of years since the report was published, thinking has developed, as have healthcare and related supports. There were real concerns expressed by transgender people and others about the role of an expert panel in validating applications. The government has now decided that a panel will not be required. Instead, there will be a delegation, a, sorry, a declaration and a validation process administered by the Department of Social Protection. The aim is a more progressive and dignified process, which protects all cons concerned and ensures that the registration process will be robust. 
It will be based on a statutory declaration to the department by the person that they intend to live permanently in the acquired gender, and this must be accompanied by a supporting letter of validation from a me medical practitioner who is treating them. This letter will be short, it will be in a standard format, and it will simply certify that the person is transitioning or has transitioned to the new gender. The legislation will specify the type of medical practitioner providing the supporting letter. They will re require to be a specialist, sorry, to be registered on a specialist register maintained by the Medical Council, and I envisage that the specialty specified will be endocrinologists, psychiatrists, and pediatricians. The legislation will also re be require that the medical specialist is practicing in the field of care and treatment of transgender and intersex people. Under this new approach, uh, the application process will not require details of a person's care, including medical history or confirmation of a diagnosis, nor will it require that the person has lived in the acquired gender for a specific period of time after their transi transition. These are both significant changes from the original recommendations. The GRAG stated that the position of intersex people needed more research and medical expertise than was available to it, and did not therefore make any recommendation in relation to the inclusion of intersex persons in the legislation. The initial intention of the process, to include a panel and a medical diagnosis of gender identity disorder, GID, which now no longer applies, uh, would not have facilitated the inclusion of intersex persons. However, the new model proposed in the general scheme of self-declaration plus a validation by a medical practitioner practice, practicing in the field would facilitate intersex persons being included under the scope of the legislation and allow them, if they wish, to apply to be recognised in the appropriate gender. Head 7 deals with the applications from persons who have already had their acquired gender recognised in a different jurisdiction. Head 8 provides for the issuing of a gender recognition certificate by the Minister for Social Protection once the applicant has met the qualifying conditions. Head 9 deals with the effects of gender recognition and provides for the fundamental pr principle of the legislation, which is that once a gender recognition certificate is, is issued to a person, the person's acquired gender is recognised. Heads 10 to 16 deal with the establishment of the gender recognition register and the role of the registrar general in the process. The registrar's purpose is to facilitate new birth registrations of persons who have been issued with a gender recognition certificate. The register will not be open to public inspection or search. It is envis envisaged that the process will operate as follows. The applicant applies for a gender recognition certificate and, if successful, will be notified accordingly by the Department of Social Protection. The person will also be advised that the General Register Office will be in contact regarding the registration in the General Recognition Register and the issuing of a new birth certificate. In order to facilitate this, a copy of the Gender Recognition Certificate and the required particulars for the registration shall be sent to the Registrar General. As part of the process of the registration in the Gender Recognition Register, a link will be made between that entry and the corresponding original entry in the Register of Birth or Adopted Children Register. This link shall be maintained in a confidential manner. Copies, certified copies, or certified extracts of entries in the Gender Recognition Register shall not be identifiable as being from that register, as opposed to being from the Register of Births or Adopted Children. However, it should be noticed that absolute confidentiality in relation to the registers is not feasible as birth certificates or public records. While it would be possible to have some system for blocking, blocking the issuing of the original birth or adoption certificates, and this is provided for in the heads. Um, <coughs> Are you now uh, concluding? Yes, I Because we, we I, had I, asked for five minutes now. It's, it's ten minutes almost at this stage. So if you could really just summarise the rest of it. I, I apologise, Chair. Yeah. I just think yeah. because it's the legislation. Yeah, no, I do. Just I, I, I appreciate that. To, it's just um, in terms of time for questions. To, to give that, I do yeah. understand that. Um, yeah. Head 17 provides for the right of appeal by a person whose application has been refused. Head 18 provides for the correction of the content of a gender uh, recognition certificate. Head 19 provides for the revocation by the Minister of a gender recognition certificate um, if the person did not meet the qualification criteria at the time. Um, head 20 makes it an offence to knowingly provide false information. Um, as I said, formal, rec formal uh, recognition is for all uh, state purposes. Um, a, head, a number of these heads, I would call, are kind of fail-safe heads to provide for uh, contingencies that may arise. So Head 21 deals with parenthood and provides that a change in a person's recognised gender shall not change the responsibilities of that person as a parent. Heads 22 to 24 deal with matters of succession, trustees and personal representatives, and I won't go into detail on those. 
Head 25 provides for gender spe spe uh, specific criminal offences um, and really provides that uh, a person can be prosecuted if it arises for sexual offences specific to their original gender committed post recognition or the other way around uh, pre recognition. Um, Head 26 covers participation in sporting activities. Um, and just to say, the, gener the general scheme of the bill does not include specific provisions in relation to equality for tra transgender persons, as discrimination on the basis of transgender is already prohibited under, uh, under the gender ground under the existing legislation. However, we have been liaising with the Department of Justice and Equality and the Office of the Attorney General as to whether the equality legislation should be amended to explicitly prohibit discrimination against a transgender person or an intersex person. That's just for the committee's information. Um, okay, and well, I thanks. think that's yeah. kind of okay. summarises it. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Sarah Phillips. Now, again, I would ask people that they would keep to the five because we'll, we'll have plenty of time to go back for more detail in terms of the questions and that. So, uh, Sarah Phillips. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to start by thanking actually Minister Burton for progressing this issue with the publication of draft heads of bill and for referring it to this committee for consideration. We would also like to thank Deputy Tuffy for inviting us uh, to speak here today and thank all the members of the committee for your careful consideration of the issues that will be raised over the coming days. In May of this year, Minister Alan Shatter addressed a conference, a Europe of Equal Citizens hosted as part of the EU-Irish EU Presidency. The theme of Minister Shatter's speech was, spoke to the ways in which legislation affects the everyday lives of communities. He spoke of how legislation, justice bodies and society as a whole must work effectively and responsibly to the needs and the rights of citizens. In the past, Irish, successive Irish governments have failed to provide true equality, often having to be dragged through the courts to do the right thing. Minister Shatter's speech was a true reflection on this history. In fact, Dr Lydia Foy first asked for her birth certificate in 1993, 20 years ago, and it's been six years since Ireland was found in breach of our positive obligations under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Legislating for gender recognition is an opportunity to do the right thing. Transgender people in Ireland experience a significant marginalisation and stigmatisation. Our community faces some of the highest levels of discrimination in employment, education and healthcare, which relegates many of us to the fringes of society. This government has an opportunity to significantly improve the everyday lives of the trans community with the immediate introduction of inclusive, progressive gender recognition legislation that is based on human rights principles. This will also send a clear message that government sees trans people as valuable contributing members of Irish society. During the course of these two days, we implore the committee to seriously consider the needs of the community this legislation proposes to serve, the Irish transgender community. It is imperative that this committee and those legislating listen to these voices and suggest amendments to the legislation that reflect our real lives. The draft heads of bill is a significant step forward from the Gender Recognition Advisory Group report from 2011, and we commend the Department of Social Protection for all their work in this area. However, while it provides some improvements, there are still significant challenges uh, to infringe on the rights, privacy, and dignity of the trans community and on our everyday lives. In consultation with our community and their families, we've outlined a summary of key issues and changes we ask the committee to consider. The first is the proposed supporting documentation, physician statement attesting to identity. The proposed requirement that a primary testing treating physician shall confirm a person has transitioned or is transitioning to their required gender will be onerous for many members of the trans community. However, the physician statement model means that access to gender recognition certificate is still based on interventions by medical professionals. And I must also state that expert knowledge in this field and practitioners is very lacking in Ireland. And this head puts the process therefore in the hands of a very few uh, number of practitioners and hence creates a panel. 
The use of the language of transition also excludes intersex persons whose bodies simply develop naturally. The same transition language also infers medical treatment of hormones or surgery, and thus may be even more restrictive than a criteria of diagnosis, which would not require any physical intervention. Some trans people may not be able to undergo a medical in transition due to age or an existing medical condition that prevents treatment. Appearing before the Oireachtas Joint Committee on Health and Children in July 2013, Dr Philip Crowley, HSC National Director of Quality and Patient Safety, uh, HSE National Director of Quality and Patient Safety stated, the HSC endorses a gender recognition process which places the responsibility of self-declaration on the applicant rather than on the details of a medical certificate or diagnosis. In doing so, the emphasis is placed on a medical or process of legal recognition of that self-declaration as opposed to the legal recognition of the medical certificate or diagnosis. The HSE considers process to be simpler, fairer, pragmatic, and maybe easier to legislate for as it takes account of both transgender and intersex people with differing backgrounds and contexts. The uncoupling of health and legal rights is being called for in human rights discourse in Europe and beyond. The Department of Social Protection has received letters from trans health experts across the world. They state unanimously that appropriate trans health care is vital and that legal gender recognition is a human right and should not have anything to do with medical care. I sit before you as an Irish woman, a very proud Irish woman, with a transgender history. In all my aspects of my life, I am female. I am an active member of my family, my community. I am a taxpayer, employed as a consultant in the construction industry, as an active member of society. Legal recognition of my gender identity should not be bound to proof by a third party. It should be bound to proof by me. We as individuals are all arbiters of our own gender identities, everybody in this room included. Tenney recommends that each person's self-defined gender identity should be fully respected and legally recognised by the state. Tenney recommends adopting the existing and robust model of declaration as used in the deed poll process. The second area of concern is age criteria. Only people who are 18 years of age will be entitled to apply for gender recognition in Ireland. Our colleagues both Transparency and Belong To will speak in more detail in this section. However, Tenney recommends setting the age for applying independently at 16 years and older and allowing parents and guardians to apply for legal recognition on behalf of people under the age of 16 years of age. The third area is single criteria, the divorce rec requirement. Only people who are single and will be eligible to apply for gender recognition. Both at the international and European level, human rights discourse affirms that divorce should not play a role in legal recognition of gender identity. In Ireland, just I'm moment, to just finishing yeah, up here, yeah, just yeah, no, the last paragraph. Great, great. Okay. Um, both uh, at international and European level, human rights discourse affirms that divorce should not play a role in the legal recognition of gender identity. In Ireland, there are families that exist where one spouse has transitioned. Despite adversity, these individuals have stayed together and will now be forced to choose between their families and the legal recognition of their true identities, which Article 41 of the Constitution is supposed to guard against. In conclusion, trans people are vibrant members of Irish society. As I have said earlier, we belong to families, we are parents, we are children, we are siblings. We are active members of our communities, we work and go to school, we pay tax, we are proud of our country. And we agree with Minister Shatter, it is time that legislation in Ireland speaks to the needs of the community it serves. Now is the time to introduce legislation that provides the trans community with the possibility of leading private, dignified, respectful lives as active members of Irish society. It is time the trans community were allowed to come out of the shadows. So we ask this committee carefully to consider the issues that we raise and our colleagues will speak to and take an active part in suggesting amendments to the draft heads of bill. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay, the next uh, speaker is Catherine Cross. And again, I would emphasise, uh, Catherine, to keep to the five minutes, if at all possible. Okay. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the committee for giving the opportunity to speak on behalf of Transparency. We are a support group for families and parents of transgender people. 
I'm the mother of a 16-year-old uh, transgender child who is currently in fifth year at secondary school. Faces all the normal challenges of being a teenager that are compounded by being transgender. And whilst he's doing really well at school and generally well accepted by his peers, um, that is due in part to the fact that he's a very strong character and also that the school are extremely understanding of his situation. But they are in no way obliged to acknowledge his preferred gender. And he's at the mercy of their personal feelings and beliefs. Um, I understand other transgender children have not been so lucky. Many have had to hide who they are or simply just leave the education system because of lack of acceptance. My son recently completed transition year, where he had to partake of many activities that were gender-based, such as discussions on personal hygiene, contraceptive advice that were given to groups separated by gender. And of course, he found that really awkward, so he opted not to partake of it. Now, the school did facilitate him, but it was at their discretion. His female name continues to be called at role, which is a constant reminder both to him and his peers that he is different. He'll shortly be applying to sit his leaving search exam. He'll be applying for courses through the CAO, all in female gender, which will unfortunately follow him through to college, where he has to explain his situation to a new set of people. The formal education system determines what life chances are available to us. So it's really important that everyone gets the opportunity, or more importantly, the equality of opportunity to engage and access the system. It's a very accurate predictor of future incomes and quality of life. Um, so it's really important that people stay in it as long as possible to get the best outcome for that. If a transgender child applies to an all-boys school, he may be refused entry on producing his birth certificate. It will, in fact, state he's female. If the school, schools are in no way obliged to provide uh, adequate changing facilities for transgender children, and a lot of the time they simply don't know what to do about it. Without proper legislation, there are no guidelines for the schools, and very often personal beliefs and prejudice become path of action. The Oroctors can amend these situations by amending the legislation to include the under-18s. And the onus will then be on the education system or the service providers to educate themselves and put those clear guidelines in place. It's been accepted that the HSE will and should um, provide health care on the basis of need for all transgender children between the ages of 12 and 18. But without correct correction of gender legislation, they'll be carrying conflicting documents and may be identified incorrectly and be subject to further discrimination. The Ombudsman for Children has clearly advised that the current proposals do not operate in the interests of children, nor will it vindicate their rights. I do understand the need to protect the interests of children under 18, and I, th I guess this is the thinking behind excluding them from the, from the legislation. But I do think that you grossly underestimate the, interest, the, the, the ability of parents to safeguard the interests of their children. And I cannot imagine that anybody would undertake this process of changing the gender on their child's birth certificate without having explored every single other avenue first. I understand that the Argentinian and Maltese governments have recently included the under-18s in their recent gender legislation. Does that imply that they are better suited to guard the interests of their children than we are here in Ireland? This legislation has a, the, the, the ability to enhance and make a real difference in the life of my son. It will allow him to participate in society, feeling valued and allow his many other attributes to shine through. Transgender is part of who he is, but it's not what defines him. Please allow him to trans transition into adulthood in a bit more dignity. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Andy Mannion uh, to, make the, uh, to make the presentation on behalf of Blong Chugu. Okay. Um, my name is Andy Mannion, and I'm, fr I'm, a young, I'm a young trans man from and peer educator from Belong to Youth Services. And um, Belong to Youth Services is the national youth organisation for lesbian, gay, bisexual and trans young people in Ireland. 
founded in 2003, we are funded by the Department of Children and Youth, and Youth Affairs, the Department of Education and Skills and the HSE's National Office for Suicide Prevention. As well as direct youth services, we are also, in, we are, we are also engaged in national policy, training and awareness raising, especially related to tackling homophobic and transphobic bullying in schools. We very much appreciate this opportunity to speak to the Joint Committee. Our comms today are based upon our work over the past 10 years with the growing numbers of trans young people. In 2012, Belong To's national network of LGBT youth um, services provided individual and, support, and group support for 47 trans young people across Ireland, including 28 in Dublin. So far in 2013, we've provided support for 42 trans young people in Dublin alone. Um, Belong to strongly, recommend, st strongly welcomes the government's introduction of legislation to legally recognise the preferred gender of trans people. Although we agree with Tenney's broader recommendations, Belong to's comments are focused on one topic, the age criteria for gender recognition. Belong to is very concerned that the blanket exclusion of under 18s from the Gender Recognition Bill contravenes <coughs> with the spirit of Irish commitments to the rights of children. It will also expose trans young people to increased risk of mental health difficulties, bullying and reduced educational attainment and school completion. Trans young people have told Belong To that it would be too painful to wait until they are, eight, are 18 to apply for gender recognition. Significantly, they fear that it would set in stone the very unwelcome climate they face in schools. For example, trans young Trans youth are told to hide their identities, are not allowed to use their preferred pronouns or names, are not allowed to wear the uniforms or use the toilets or changing rooms that reflect their preferred gender. Um, further to the recommendations in our submission to the Joint Committee, Belong to strongly uh, welcomes the advice of the Ombudsman for Children on the Gender Recognition Bill. The um, Ombudsman Children's Office completed uh, thorough review of international and domestic law and concluded that the exclusion of the under 18s would not be in keeping with, for example, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, the European Convention on Human Rights and the Irish Constitution. At um, 1.6 in their advice, the um, Ombudsman for Children um, states that the Gender Recognition Bill, as currently drafted, is unlikely to safeguard children. We also concur with their advice that the age cri cri criterion be removed from the Gender Recognition Bill, parents or guardians be enabled to apply for gender recognition certificates on behalf of their children, and young people over the age of 16 be enabled to apply for gender recognition certificates on their own behalf. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Andy. Uh, the next speaker is Leslie Sherlock uh, for LGBT Noise. Hi, I'm Leslie Sherlock and I'm a transgender ally, activist and educator with LGBT Noise. We're a non-party, political, voluntary, independent group and we'd like to thank you for this opportunity. I'm not the one you should be listening to though. It's an injustice that this panel isn't exclusively comprised of trans and intersex people. They are the only experts on their identities and experiences. They're one of Ireland's most marginalised, populations and it's shocking and insulting that they haven't been properly involved in this process to date, this process that's solely about their rights. Not only have trans people not been sufficiently involved, but their concerns remain unaddressed by a heads of bill which, however unintentionally, is demeaning to this group of already disenfranchised people. When we're born, a cursory glance is taken at our genitals and we're assigned a sex that dictates our path for life. We're categorized as either male or female in every single interaction. Toilets, schools, clothes, toys, social roles, and legal rights are all distinguished by gender, something most of us never question. We're all assigned a sex at birth, and we all have a gender identity, that internal sense of gender, which may or may not correspond with our identity, or with our anatomy, sorry. Our gender identities are individual and personal. We all have one. Each one of us is the most qualified expert on our own gender identity. This legislation is about gender identities. It's a way to legally reflect a person's internal sense of gender when it doesn't fit the norm. Simply put, 
If someone has ever questioned that sex they were assigned at birth, they might be looking to avail of this legislation. Certainly it's the individual that holds all the knowledge of their gender. Gay and lesbian people don't need a doctor to confirm that their, their identity when they look for a civil partnership. Marriages, driver's license, passports, any legal function does not require medical confirmation. We are the experts on our own identities. With all due respect to the medical profession and all that they undoubtedly do for trans and intersex people, requiring a physician statement to confirm a transition is stigmatizing and degrading. It implies that the individual is not the expert on their experience and it unnecessarily involves the medical profession in what is solely a legal issue. What's more, the concept of transitioning does not apply to all and especially intersex people do not transition. Many will be unfit for hormones or surgeries due to medical or age contraindications. Others simply do not want a medical intervention. Their bodily integrity and right to determine their own identity needs to be upheld. The specialty group of medical expertise on this issue in Ireland is tiny, and they undoubtedly have a vested interest in arguing that the medical profession be involved here. Surgeries and hormones don't determine a person's identity. If someone does not medically transition or does not wish to engage in medical procedures, their gender identity is still valid. Gender recognition is about legal rights and self-determined identities. It has nothing to do with medicine. Other jurisdictions have made movements to de-link the medical from the legal, and this has been recommended by the former Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights and by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Experts in this field recommend delinking the medical. Gender recognition is a process about birth certificates. It should be as simple and straightforward as any birth, death, or marriage registry. The heads of bill propose the Minister for Social Protection as a decision-making authority, and this creates an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy and contributes to the sentiment that trans people are not the experts on their own identities. We recommend that the entire process be put under the Registrar General, who it is envisaged would maintain the Gender Recognition Register. This would be the least expensive, most simple, and most humane option. The Heads of Bill completely ignores trans people under 18. Youth face bullying and discrimination constantly, and, the, and is it right to legislate putting these vulnerable young people in a situation that increases their marginalization? Ms. Ryan states that intersex people are included in the heads, but the language is unclear, and in fact it, it excludes by the language of transition. Many people enter marriages before, their, before realizing their trans identity. Despite the odds, some of these marriages remain loving and supportive. The requirement that an applicant is single effectively forces divorce and puts people in the impossible situation of choosing between their family and their gender identity. Our Constitution's special protection of marriage seems not to be extended to one of society's most marginalized groups. And finally, the heads propose prohibiting trans people from sport. Regulation of sport is not a government responsibility, and this actually creates new discrimination that didn't exist previously. Legislation should be protecting people and promoting inclusion, not legalizing discrimination. It's imperative to protect the people of Ireland with this legislation, and to do so with respect. Respect means seeing trans and intersex people as human beings as diverse people with real lives, with families, and as the experts in their own experiences. Lydia Foy first requested an amendment to her birth certificate 20 years ago, and still she waits. Ireland is one of the very last countries in Europe to implement this legislation. It's really important that we grasp this opportunity to listen to trans people, to learn from our neighbors, and to get it right the first time if we don't, there will be court cases, further work, and additional costs to the state. I urge you to make strong recommendations to the minister for a process that is simple, speedy, and respectful. But don't take it from me. 
Listen to transgender people. They're the experts. Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks, Leslie. Leslie, uh, just in relation to, uh, I just want to clarify that matter about who has been invited before the committee. Um, we made a call for submissions, and uh, you know, this, this, we had a process where people could look to make uh, a presentation before the committee as part of their submission. And every single group that requested to make a submission or make a presentation to these hearings has been invited to do so, and uh, including your own group, right? And it would have been very appropriate for us to put conditions on who could make those presentations. So just to clarify that, it, wouldn't, it, would, it would have been inappropriate uh, and uh, certainly not considered to be proper. So just to clarify that that's the situation. Uh, all groups that have requested to make uh, presentations ha are being allowed to do so, okay? Without condition, okay? All right. Um, I'm going to now call on um, our last speaker, uh, uh, Professor Donald O'Shea, to make his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the uh, invitation to uh, present uh, this afternoon. And uh, I have uh, listened with great interest to all the presentations, and uh, I think they've been uh, very informative to me, and hopefully will be to the process. I'm, I'm an adult endocrinologist, so I deal with the uh, adults uh, with gender dysphoria. Um, and uh, I have uh, liaised with our Faculty of Paediatrics um, and with one of the UK uh, experts in the paediatric uh, management of gender dysphoria uh, ahead of this or as part of my kind of ongoing uh, work. Uh, and the numbers that were alluded to in terms of the, uh, what your group are dealing with would appear to be, you know, you're dealing with some but you're not capturing all, and what you need to be doing is capturing all, because there would be about 50 new cases at a, in a paediatric age group in Ireland every year. Um, I'm not going to restate the definition um, of, of gender. It, it's now called dysphoria in the new American Class Psychiatric Association classification uh, of uh, disorders, but disorder has been removed from the terminology, and there was a talk that the whole condition was going to be removed uh, from the classification for um, diseases, which um, would have been seen as a positive step by many, uh, but might have left it without a medical management framework, because there's a lot of medical input required for a lot of these uh, individuals. Uh, in Ireland, the diagnosis is confirmed by a mental health professional psychiatrist or psychologist, and then there is a referral for hormonal therapy, which is available uh, in Ireland. Medical services are not wide enough in this country yet, but uh, they are improving somewhat. After a period of about two years, usually on hormonal therapy and or living in role, uh, the uh, individuals are referred for surgery. Some of that surgery is available in Ireland, uh, the breast and the uterine surgery, but full complex uh, gender reassignment surgery uh, is carried out either in the UK or Belgium through the HSE treatment abroad scheme. The waiting time for surgery is probably about two years from referral. Uh, we have had 246 patients uh, through uh, our adult service in, in Lockdownstown Hospital. 25% uh, of that cohort either are or have been married, um, and that would be over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the learning in our unit from the last 10 years that might inform the proposed legislation uh, would be as follows, in my view. It would be in the best interest of the group overall that some form of medical supporting statement form a part of the validation process. It would have to be minimally intrusive and from a recognised uh, regulated specialist in the area. Uh, this would be to protect uh, a minority of patients within, in the overall group who think that they have the condition but do not. And self-declaration alone would support this minority in what is a personality disorder and potentially worsen uh, their outcome. Uh, legislating for any minority is difficult. And in legislating for gender dysphoria, I think that we do need to be aware of the potential impact on a minority within that cohort that I have seen over the last 10 years have really bad outcomes. 
it is a minority. Um, many of the patients with gender dysphoria who attend our clinic uh, do not actually have uh, contact with other transgender uh, patients or support groups because they want to move forward exclusively in their uh, preferred gender. Uh, the issue uh, of age in this legislation is very important from a constitutional point of view, uh, but from a medical point of view, the age that's most important is the age of puberty, which obviously you cannot legislate uh, for. Uh, before puberty, there is a reported 20% desist rate, which is change uh, of mind uh, as the uh, process moves forward. Uh, after puberty, uh, this falls to less than 5% uh, desist rate. Um, transitioning uh, does not require, and the diagnosis of gender uh, dysphoria does not require hormones, does not require surgery, and any um, letter of support uh, w would not have to include uh, that uh, stage or concept. Uh, in my view. Uh, my reading of the legislation in the current heads is that the intersex group, which is extraordinarily complex, uh, would uh, be uh, comfortably uh, catered for um, within the legislation as I see it uh, drafted. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Okay. All right, uh, thanks very much, uh, Donald. Um, okay, I'm now going to move to questions. And before I do, I would just say that uh, I was saying earlier that the proceedings were being broadcast on UPC Channel 207. Now, a member of the public has contacted the committee just to let us know that there is some interference, which is probably from a mobile phone or possibly other electronic equipment. So just to let members know, so that, uh, you know, it is best if people turn off their <coughs> equipment completely. Do you know, it does make for better uh, broadcasting. And obviously, the members of the public who would have an interest in watching this. So that's one uh, point. Um, in relation to the questions, um, what I would ask the witnesses to do is to make a note of the questions, because obviously if the questions particularly are directed at you, your group, or you, you yourself, well, then you'll need to come back and respond to those questions. But also if you think that you have a point to make about a particular question, that you'd note that as well. Um, so just ask you, to, just for your own assistance, to do that. And I'm basically going to start in the order of spokespersons. I've asked uh, members to keep, uh, if at all possible, to their contributions to three minutes, and, and they may get in at a second time, if appropriate. Um, and I'm doing it in the order of spokespersons, and then according to how people indicate. So I'm starting with uh, Deputy Osnodig. Gro Margaret, um, I want to thank everybody who has turned out today. I think it's been a very useful uh, exposition of, uh, of uh, some of the issues relating to this bill, and, and kind of I've, I've taken a, an interest in the last year or so in trying to address, I think, a shortfall in Irish law, um, and um, it, it, it's interesting how, if you want, the government has moved in that period, and kind of this this bill is welcome, but kind of hopefully uh, this process will inform uh, the department and the minister to make changes that are required so that we can have, if you want, the best uh, possible legislation at the end of this. This is a, a, a new process which has happened only in a number of occasions with legislation, um, and, uh, and that's why it's, it's welcome that you have the likes of yourselves here kind of, and the department officials. There's a number of questions I'll ask at this stage just of the, the department. Um, one, I presume, would probably be asked by a number of people as it relates to the, the age barrier and the criticism that the Ombudsman for Children has made and are you aware of, uh, of those and kind of uh, is it the intention to look again at uh, the, 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 the age of 18 and the suggestion that that should be reduced. The second one is in relation to the, the requirement that somebody isn't in a marriage or in a civil partnership. Um, have you sought the view of the Attorney General to see whether it is constitutional um, to put a ban on somebody who is married um, from 
gaining other rights. Um, it seems to be a con contradiction, and I know it is one of the contradictions which delayed the publication of, of legislation for the last number of years. Um, but just I would be concerned that kind of having gone this far and producing a piece of legislation that then it will f fall at the first legal uh, challenge, and we, 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 we then start all over again. And finally, um, in the heads of the bill, it, it, it suggests a definition. Um, what definition is going to be used? There are a number of definitions in the international field, um, uh, and there's a number of um, wordings, and, uh, and they have different implications then on the, on the legislation. So has that definition um, of, of gender identity been um, chosen at this stage? Okay, and uh, I'm going to bring in, I sh I, apologies to Senator Power, because Senator Power, according to our practice committee, should have been brought in first. But, uh, I'll Senator Power. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to thank <coughs> sorry, all of our guests for your initial contributions. I suppose I want to start by welcoming the bill. I'm, I'm particularly on commending Minister Burton for being the first minister to bring forward legislation in this area, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, I suppose, maybe before we get into critiquing it. Um, but I am concerned, uh, as, as, as Deputy O'Snonig has outlined, as I know other members will express, about a number of provisions in the bill. And personally, I strongly believe that all, that all trans people should be entitled to legal protection, regardless of their age, their marital status, their civil partnership. And I think that when we are now coming to this legislation at such a late point in comparison to other European countries, we have an opportunity to learn from those experiences and get it right first and actually start with best practice rather than starting with where other people were maybe 10 or 20 years ago. Um, so I, I think those are big issues, as Catherine and Andy have so eloquently outlined. Lack of protection for young people has a huge impact, and this committee is responsible both for social protection and for education. Um, and to hear about the obstacles, the day-to-day -day obstacles that young people have to experience in our schools, and the impact that that must have on their education, I think, is something that we can't ignore as a committee. And it certainly is a strong argument for me for adopting the changes that have been proposed by the Ombudsman for Children. But the main area that I want to ask uh, questions about, because I know we only have we have the department at this uh, initial stage today, <coughs> is about the forced divorce requirement. Um, because I don't if some couples maybe won't, some couples don't survive um, transition and, and go their separate ways, but many do stay together. Um, and I have to say that I've Again, other countries have taken a, a, a different route, and there have been challenges, uh, court cases, European Court of Human Rights cases, um, as well, where forced divorce requirements in other countries ha have been struck down. But I mean, I have two main issues here. One is that, as Tenny have pointed out in, in some of their correspondence, there's a chance legally that if a couple has survived the process of transition, they're happy to stay together, they want to stand together, stay together, there's actually a very good chance that a court might decide that they don't satisfy, satisfy the criteria for divorce because they couldn't be considered to be totally irreconcilable. These are people who actually want to stay together and keep their family together, so I think that's a risk. But if indeed you know, divorce does apply and that, that's not an issue and people are able to get a divorce, I still think it's really problematic to force a family to split up. Um, for the spokesperson, Simonetta Ryan from the department said that you referred just briefly to the constitutional context um, as the reason for that requirement. I'd like to have more details on that um, because, if anything, I think there's a constitutional context for protecting the family. Protection of the family is very strong in the Irish constitution. Protection of marriage, um, again, incredibly strong. And I think it could be constitutionally problematic, and I've read very persuasive legal opinion on this, to force a family to break up. You actually have an external group imposing uh, divorce on a family I think could be very constitutionally problematic. Um, and uh, secondly, I think that it's, it's, as far as I can see, and from the work that's been done by Fergus Ryan in particular, um, wrote a very good article on this. I think it's also legally unnecessary because in Irish law in general and family law, the validity of a marriage is based on the status of the people at the time that they entered into it. Uh, it's whether you were actually capable at that time of entering into a valid marriage. Um, and I think it's, it's arguable on that basis 
that there's, it's completely legally unnecessary to go separating people, forcing people to divorce many years later if at the time that they uh, got married they were capable of contracting the marriage. So putting aside the issue of marriage equality that hopefully will be dealt with in, in the near future, even before any of that is looked at, I think it's actually unnecessary um, because the marriage was valid at the time that it was contracted. But I suppose I'd like to finish just by asking if the department would share your legal advice with us because, I mean, I, Frank, I don't think it's, it's good enough just to say that there's a constitutional context, I think we really need to see the meat of this. Um, because all of us as members want to do the right thing, but legally want to make sure that legislation that we pass will stand up to scrutiny in the courts. Um, but we need to have that information as well to be able to judge this uh, issue properly. As I said, contrasting opinions have been put forward um, by Fergus Ryan, by FLAC. Um, there's a letter there from the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights to Minister Borton in relation to the ECHR context of, of all of this. And I think it is a very big legal issue. And I think for us to discuss it meaningfully as a committee, we should all be working off the same information. So I'd like to make that request to the department in particular. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Senator. Um, so I'm just going to bring in one more uh, for, before we go back uh, to the guests. Um, Deputy Collins. Yeah, I won't take so long because I think a lot of points were made about the legal aspect of it there, so there's no point in being repeated. And um, thanks very much for coming in. And um, one thing is also I, I also sort of work off my gut instinct on things, and when I know something's right, you know it's right. <laughs> and then. Um, uh, you know from the re over the last number of, of sessions and talking to people and that that there's a reality there and it's for our society then to try and address that reality rather than trying to find barriers to stop it um, and that's why I'd like to ask the, um, the Department of Social Protection um, people in here today and thanks very much for coming in um, the Ombudsman has said for children has said quite clearly that there's um, vindication of, of, of young people's rights here as well and um, that you know in protecting children as from 16 to 18 year olds or, or younger that is society's responsibility but in this instance it's saying that it could do the other the opposite effect on that um, and I agree with what the Ombudsman for Children is saying here that you can't just put a blanket ban on 16 to 18 year olds, there must be provision made for them and then whatever way that's best working with the community um, of, of transgender people and intersex people is to how, try and how do we do that. Um, and I think there's very good positive proposals being put here by the Ombudsman and from the uh, different groups here today in relation to um, dealing with that issue. And it's just maybe a question I'd like to put to um, uh, Professor Donald. Donald. Um, to put any category, and I would have argued this strongly even in relation to the um, legislation that went through on the uh, abortion issue, to sort of frame people in the mental health, to be able to assess where a person is at and whether they have a right to or not to or whatever. And I think the same would be here. Why are we putting people from the transgender community and intersex into that category of mental health? And um, surely, as, as soon as somebody indicates that they are not in their own body as such, or they feel they're not in their own body, they're immediately in contact with the medical service in some way. The parents will contact the doctors, the GPs, all those sort of things. At a very young age, it's developing over a period of time. And um, so it's quite clearly seen as a, a pathway to a person reaching 16 to 18 that they're, you know, the person's moving through a certain d direction and a certain phase in their life and, the, and a certain change in their body. So why isn't there a situation looking at having a specialist, you know, I don't know what you think of it, I'd have to go by what you'd say, um, a specialist area to sort of link in the young people who are developing and processing into a certain, you know, specialist arena that can actually assist young people coming through that. And I think it would be very clear from parents, from the young person and from the people involved in it, the medical profession, that you can see that developing without putting a mental health psychologist report over somebody I just don't that doesn't fit well with me from that point of view at all and, and what you think of that um, and that'd be questioned then obviously the HSE linking in with the uh, the specialists and the the parents and the children in relation to that because I just don't think that's the right way to go I, I, I just it just grinds against what I would feel is the right um, approach and, and listen to the experiences of all the people in the transgender community 
Okay, um, I'm going to go to the department first because there was a few uh, questions there and um, then if anyone else, uh, well, uh, uh, Professor O'Shea was mentioned as well, but then I'll go to the other, uh, other guests. So, um, Simonetta. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to say at the outset, because we're dealing with the general scheme of a bill, um, we obviously haven't, this has not been drafted by the OPC, so we don't have, um, for example, uh, Deputy Snuddy asked about the definition under the um, the first head of the bill. Uh, we don't have those definitions yet, um, but it might, it will be an opportunity for me just to say, and I think Professor Shea picked this up as well, that uh, in relation to intersex, people with intersex uh, conditions, that the wording can be such that it can provide for those people. So I, I didn't sort of specify that when I, when I was do, doing my, my presentation at the start. Um, I think Deputy you also mentioned the question of age, as have a, as have a number of other people. Um, I said at the start that the recommendations in this bill, the, the scheme of this bill is based on the recommendations of the GRAG report, with additional changes which the Minister has uh, got approval from her colleagues in Cabinet to, uh, particularly with relation to validation. But the position on age um, is the recommendation that was in the GRAG report. Um, it is based, I guess, on a kind of a prudent approach. Um, and, and Professor O'Shea has also talked about the difficulties for young people um, and the fact that in some cases uh, people may change their minds. Um, I, do, I do accept it's a difficult area. Um, that being said, I think there was a very clear decision by government um, that the age would be 18 um, and, and the, the uh, legislation is being drawn up on that basis. Okay. Um, Okay, um, well, that's probably more a, a policy matter, really, I suppose, uh, or within legal constraints and so on. But, um, okay, uh, Professor O'Shea, there was a couple of issues there raised with yourself as well. Um, well, back to Deputy O'Snoddy and the, the age of 16. Um, and I'll go back to what I said, the, the really important age is puberty, and that's when a, a treatment in ideal management of this condition would start. Uh, at a particular stage of puberty, that if there is a change of mind, puberty has still got going, and if the person, uh, even though you think it's the right thing at the time, actually says later on, you know, it, it has been described in, I think, what, the 25% uh, or 20% of cases, there is a change of mind uh, if it's diagnosed before puberty. So you absolutely need uh, access to paediatric care for this condition in this country, which uh, is rudimentary. The service we provide for the adults is inadequate, but the service for, for children uh, uh, is, uh, you know, really, it, it's minimal. And I know that uh, people who are here today are working on having such a service uh, and agitating for such a service to be uh, d developed. The definition that would be used I think it would be the DSM-5, uh, the, the newly revised as of August of this year definition uh, by the American uh, Psychiatric Association, which separates for the first time adults from children and adolescents. And I think it is that needs to happen so that you put treatment pathways in place for both. Uh, the issue of forced divorce, you know, we have uh, very happily married uh, couples uh, expecting children uh, who have young children, very committed to each other, um, and, um, you know, uh, those couples will force change uh, because you cannot force divorce. Um, and if, and then, so the Constitution just will have to change to reflect that, you know. Uh, the issue of it uh, being a mental health label is a big issue, uh, and it's a contentious issue. Um, and you know the uh, fact that you know homosexuality was only removed from the DSM classification in the 1970s just uh, is, a, I think, a very good uh, yardstick of how offensive that whole area is and can be. Uh, the, the situation with uh, gender dysphoria is that a lot of medical input is required. 
uh, that needs to be facilitative, not a barrier. Uh, and um, for a medical condition to get treatment, it has to exist as a medical condition. And if you take it out of the medical diagnosis completely, and you then go to the HSE and say, please treat this thing that doesn't exist as a condition, you won't be able to get treatment for it. So the only reason that we uh, will get traction uh, with uh, the health service uh, kind of environment is because it's a condition for which there's an international recognised treatment pathway that we're not adequately providing in this country at an adult level, that we're barely providing at a paediatric level, uh, and therefore we need to do better in the medical sphere. Um, but I think in time, in 20 years' time, they will be talking about uh, gender coming out of uh, the DSM classification, because it very nearly came out this time of the DSM-5 classification. But it's in there at the moment, and we will have to work within that system. Okay, uh, any other group? Can yeah, I respond to that? Yeah. Um, just to be clear, we're talking about two things here. This is a legal right, and I think the medical discussion, while very relevant and pertinent, is actually a separate issue. Um, and beyond that, the, psych the psych psychiatric um, debate is again a separate issue. It seems as though we're all in agreement that the psychiatric diagnosis isn't perhaps the most uh, respectful or relevant. Um, <coughs> It is a mental condition, and I think there's a distinction to be made between mental conditions and medical conditions. Something like pregnancy can be diagnosed and can be treated as medical, but it does not have to be mental. Um, so, I, like, I agree with that, and I just want to say that in terms of the regret statistics, I also think that that's very irrelevant. Marriage has also a rate of regret. People go in for divorce because they regret having their marriage or they change their mind. And I think the same argument can be made for this. It's a legal right. And yeah, there will be percentages of regret. But I think instead we should look at the percentages of people who don't regret. 76% um, of young trans people in the UK knew of their trans identity by the time they left primary school. The vast majority of trans people are aware and certain of their trans identity by the age of three. So I think that that's where we need to be concentrating. We can't legislate for the few outliers. I think we need to legislate for the majority of people who will be very certain at a very young age of their gender identity. And we have a responsibility to protect them from the harm that results from not being able to have that identity confirmed. So, and again, I just would remind you to, to look at the medical issue as separate from the legal issue. They're, they're two completely separate things here. Thanks. Um, before I bring in Sarah, I, I know that Senator Power asked a question about the constitutional, which way, like in terms of the, is it to make people separate or, you know, to keep them together, which fits into the constitutional framework. Have you any comments on that? Yeah, well, there were a number of comments and I hadn't, uh, I didn't um, have an opportunity just to, to finish out there. Um, first of all, the Ombudsman's for Children's intervention, we are of course aware of the Ombudsman's for Children's views and they have been submitted to the Minister. Um, in relation to um, marriage, you know, we do accept that that is a difficult issue and there are very serious constitutional issues there and also issues vis-a-vis -vis the European Convention on Human Rights, um, but it's not something that we can resolve in the legislation. Um, I think that, uh, as you possibly know, Senator, I couldn't obviously give you a copy of or divulge um, advice that we would have from the Attorney General. I wouldn't be permitted to do that. But I think that the whole area of the discussion of the Constitution and the position of marriage within the Constitution um, and same-sex marriage specifically, that's all a matter for the, really the Department of Justice rather than ourselves. But if that is to change in the future, um, then it obviously will allow us an opportunity to, to deal with, with the outcome of that in this legislation. Um, but I, I don't think that we have, um, uh, you know, there's nothing much further I can say on that, unfortunately. Um, and I think that uh, that possibly, I think there was, a, I think that um, Deputy O'Snoddy, you, you also said, in, would this legislation necessarily fall? Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I can't predict what may happen, but I think that the legislation itself, in relation to those people who satisfy the criteria that are in the legislation, um, that those people will get their will get their gender recognition. So I think that 
that for the, those majority of people, we can at least be satisfied that they should be they should be covered. Sure, sorry. sorry. Pick up briefly on that. I mean, there's there's no prohibition on you sharing the AG's advice. I know it's not standard practice, but I just there's a massive gap between maybe even sharing the full advice with us and giving us a one line sentence saying that there's a constitutional context that prevents something happening here. Because I've already, as I outlined initially, there is strong legal opinion on on the other side as well. This is this is nothing to do with same sex marriage. I am that it's marriage. Depend, but the validity of a marriage depends on the circumstances that existed at the time. There's a whole load of case law to back that up. And I think that the very least we should get is at least a paper from the department as part of these discussions. I'm setting out the main arguments or the main the cases that you're referring to, the legal precedent um, that backs up the arguments. And not just, I think it's difficult for us to evaluate the thought that you've put into it if, if all we're being told is the department is considered a constitutional context. I think we actually need to have a bit more meat than that to be able to do our job. I mean, when the legislation comes before the committee, we'll be thinking through amendments and things like that, and how are we supposed to make an informed judgment on your arguments if we haven't heard them? Sir, was it on the same issue? Yeah. Same, same, same matter. Yeah. Um, I wasn't suggesting really that the, 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 the act, because we, we all here hope that uh, progress will be made by, by, by this legislation, but if, if, if this provision remains as it is, it would be open then for somebody to challenge it. Um, and given that uh, discrimination can't happen on nine grounds at the moment, given that the uh, Constitution protects uh, marriage, uh, it is one of the problematic uh, provisions within this bill where you would force kind of a, a, a couple to divorce. Um, yes, it, in an ideal world we would have same-sex marriage and that would deal with that uh, hiccup that we have in our society and hopefully we'll see, we'll, we'll see that issue addressed shortly. But in the meantime, we have uh, this provision in front of us. Um, uh, uh, and I think we, we need to be imaginative enough um, to accept that there are happily married couples and that for them to continue to remain as a couple, as married couple or in a civil uh, partnership, that the state would be forcing them um, to divorce, which means that they'd have to live apart for four years. Um, and that, that it's, it's, it's just one of the areas I think we need to tease out, and if at all possible, um, I agree with Senator Power, that the department, if, if, if they could share some of the advice, um, some of the, the legal background, or ask the Attorney General whether kind of, uh, she, she would have a problem, or the, the Minister himself, um, to come before us just to, 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 to help us out on this. Because it will be, I know, if the bill is published in, in the way it's suggested, it will be one of the sticking points for uh, most of the people that I've talked to on this legislation. Okay, I'm, go I'm going to Deputy Warden next, but just I know, Sarah, you had just indicated, so if you could just, yeah. Through a couple of the points, if that was okay. Yeah, as quickly um, as yeah, very, very, yeah. very quickly, I, first of all, I echo what uh, Leslie said in relation to um, the medical pathway and the legal pathway. I think we've got to be very careful that we need to separate both those, and we're not saying uh, within the trans community that, you know, the medical system does need uh, some mental health support in relation to these issues, and we also obviously clearly need uh, to have that sort of support in order to provide a medical uh, uh, pathway. I think it's crucial also that um, we remember that, you know, a lot of us uh, trans people, when we get to the point of deciding or realising that we are trans, we are three and five and six years of age. There are those, yes, who are dealing with other issues, and that is what the medical health system is for. That is exactly what it's for. However, providing us with legal recognition should not be predicated on that. With all due respect, any man or woman, look, woman looking for medical assistance does not have to prove that they're male or female. They just get the medical assistance, and I think that's what we need to be careful to realise. Just to go back to the point about the marriage uh, situation, I think... It's, it's, it's also, we must remember that, I, I echo again what Avril Avril Power, Senator Avril Power said, um, this, this situation in relation to marriage is at the point of contract. And at the point of contract, those two people were legally recognised as male and female. 
And I think to, for the state to therefore then tell them that they have to break that contract is actually a travesty. There is also no provision within the bill for those people who therefore then can't access gender recognition because they decide that they need to keep their family together because they have happily uh, happy married families and they want to keep that family together. There is no provision for the possibility, having transitioned, having had surgery, having had mental intervention, that they can actually continue to keep their passport, continue to keep their driving license presently, all, as in my case, a female and female gender. And there is no provision for that situation where they're left in limbo, um, you know, going forward. And I think the last point is that while we all look forward today that same-sex marriage comes in, I think the most recent referendum shows that we still have to await a referendum and who's to say that it's actually going to be passed. So are we therefore asking uh, married couples to wait for what could be another 20 years um, for, uh, for same-sex marriage to come in? Okay. Um, Deputy O'Riordan. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for, uh, uh, for the presentations. And much of what I was going to say has already been ably um, put forward by my, my colleagues on the committee, and it's great to see this such a uniformity of views really around the issue uh, and issues at hand. Again, just to welcome the bill, I think uh, in fairness there's a lot to recommend itself about the bill and I think that a huge amount of it is, is broadly welcomed. But again, coming back to the same issues again, in relation to, there's a few of things I just want to just reiterate what has already been said. The age issue is going to be, is going to be a problem. I think what this bill needs is surgery, not butchery. But at the same time, I do feel that if this bill remains as it is, that it's going to open up a huge amount of legalistic and constitutional minefields, and I think it could spend an awful lot of time in the courts. And I think if we, together, we could view this as a kind of a roading process, that, you know, and, and we could work with this bill as it goes along, rather than viewing it as, a, as an end product that has to be accepted or rejected, I think it would be better if we did it in, the, on, in that way. On the divorce situation, I think, I, I think it's a... It's hugely constitutionally questionable, it's considering, as what others have already said, that the family is at the heart of the uh, of the Irish Constitution, uh, and to suggest that, you know, a family would have to break up, uh, and a divorce situation would have to would, would be forced from the state onto a family, I think is very constitutionally questionable. I can see uh, a case being taken at uh, High Court, Supreme Court, and being easily won, in my view, and I'm not a constitutional lawyer, on that basis, considering that the way that the Constitution is written and the interpretations that have been made in the Constitution down through the years, and the fact that we would have to wait for a, a referendum on, on, on marriage equality, uh, which could, as Sarah quite rightly says, be accepted or rejected, is, I think it's a constitutional nonsense. Um, and, and in my own view, the idea that the, that the state would force on, on a couple um, to dissolve their marriage against their will doesn't have any constitutional standing. And I think, uh, I, I, you know, every piece of legislation that goes through this, these houses, these rectors have to be in adherence with, with, with the Constitution. On the, on the children's issue, and I'm taken with the, you know, the representations a lot of us have had from Tenny and from, and from LGBT, LGBT noise and other groups as well, um, on the children's issue and mindful of the, of the, uh, advice given from the Ombudsman for Children, I think, again, there's a huge um, legalistic problem there in terms of, you know, that, that age, I mean, there are many who, who would advocate there shouldn't be an age bar at all, but certainly the age group between 16 and 18, uh, I think, is, you know, the, the recommendations here in the bill are, are highly questionable. Again, the supporting documentation, I mean, are we really advocating that we'd have, um, you know, a difference of opinion between somebody's gender identity and what somebody else says? I mean, I think that's again open for open for for a huge uh, constitutional and, and legal argument over that. I mean, uh, uh, and finally, uh, uh, maybe it's a it's, it's a minor point in the legislation, but I, I think the uh, the piece about sport is bordering on bizarre. I mean, who are we to to who are we as a legislative, legislative uh, body to tell sporting organisations or to recommend who or who can play what sport. I find that really, really just strange and odd and completely unnecessary and slightly offensive. I mean, we're, we're still trying to amend legislation 12 years ago that was brought in in good faith to allow certain bodies the right to, 
inverted commas, discrimin discri discrimination on, on the basis of, of religious ethos in, in employment law. And we're changing that now because you see that the, the context has changed. But I think something like that, I think, is unnecessary and, and, uh, and as I say, bizarre and, and offensive. And I don't necessarily... <laughs> In as much as it is, it is very strange for for the, for the, the, the state to require a divorce of a, of, of a couple that clearly are, are are very strong and committed to each other, the state would would demand what sport a person can or can't play. Uh, I, I I find that quite objectionable. But I'd be interested in in hearing your your um, your reactions to, to what I've said, which is very much in agreement with what other colleagues have said here. But I also the broad the broad point I want to make is that I hope. That what is what we have here is a process, and not a fait accompli. I hope what we have here is is a rolling, living, evolving uh, bill that can be amended and changed. And in terms of saying, you know, what the, what the government have said, 18 is is the final decision. I hope that uh, you know there be there be um, there be leeway there for that for, for that to be altered. But I would the final point I would say just to reiterate, I think if the bill stays as is. Um, you know, it, without the surgery, as I said, rather than the butchery that we can do here, then I think it actually would be butchered in in a constitutional court uh, with a case taken by somebody. Um, and I, I think we should prevent that by happen from happening by amending it here. Thanks, Chair. Okay, um, Deputy Griffin. Thank you, Chair, and um, <clears throat> thank you uh, to everyone who's, who's, who's presented here. Today and a very welcome, a very much welcome. In fact, we're actually having this process as well. I think it's a very healthy way of of, of um, doing law in, in this country, and I hope we um, that's the way we'll, we'll see a lot more of it in the future. Um, I, I concur with most of what's been said already, um, and um, you know, I don't want to be repeating too much either. Um, just in, in relation to the age issue, um, just w wondering that, and I, I agree as well you know, with what's already previously been, been said, uh, but isn't it um, something to, to be considered that, um, for example, if a person makes a mistake or um, at some stage later decides that um, you know they they they, they have um, they, they've, they've made a mistake. Is is it possible to to change that uh, under under the bill? Uh, and would that be um, a safety net as such? I suppose for for those under eighteen. Um, you know, and is that is that is that something that um, would would assist in in that area? I certainly think that at least sixteen the age of 16 should be considered. Um, but looking at the, the other uh, proposal here in relation to um, the, the parents and guardians, um, you know, wouldn't that be a safety net that if a person had an opportunity at a later stage to, to, to change back, um, that that would come around that particular problem? Um, and uh, certainly as well, um, in, in relation to the divorce requirement, I mean, I suppose it's kind of like it's like being in Dublin and going east to get to Galway. You know, you you eventually get there, but what state are you in when you get there? Um, and it's certainly the it's the long, it's the long way around. Um, you know, and, and I, it, it, I suppose it really is, it is it glaringly would open up the the leg, the, the bill um, to constitutional challenge. Uh, I think it would um, it really would be uh, something that would undermine it from the start and. Um, it seems extraordinary, really, an extraordinary path to have to force people to, to go through. Um, so I, I certainly think that um, that's something that really needs to be looked at. And um, and finally, then as well, in, in relation to the sport uh, issue, I mean, sure, again, it's it's flying in the face in the face of um, you know the, the whole equality ethos that we're we're trying to achieve. Um, that particular, um, I think it's like, is it, is it tw number 20, is it? Um, you know, so I think that's something as well that um, we really uh, need to give much greater consideration to. But look, I very much welcome the fact that the bill is being brought forward. Uh, it, is, it is progress. Um, but again, as was mentioned, um, surgery, delicate surgery is required here rather than, rather than butchery and uh, you know I think that there is a way around all of these issues and I hope that we can we can all work together to, to get to that point. Thanks. Right. Okay, um, I'll just have a couple of questions myself. Um, I suppose, you know, just in general, I suppose in terms of the panel, um, 
you know, like if this bill was passed, you know, uh, it roughly as, or, you know, as, as outlined, I mean, it would be progress, or does anyone have to disagree with that point? I suppose that's, that's the question. Um, because, like, progress can come all at once, or it can be incremental. So I suppose, you know, is it progressive legislation in itself as it stands compared to the current situation? So that's one question. And um, the other thing is in relation to uh, the um, thing of the young people. I mean, you know, like at the moment, there's no legislation in place, so there's no provision. So, like, there's people obviously who have spent many years waiting. Like, I mean, you know, like for a 16 to 18 year old, they are going to be 18, you know, like, so, like, what I'm basically saying is, okay, I'm sure there are things that can be done to provide and protect that group as best as possible, but without giving them, you know, but at the same time saying, you know, uh, that, you know, that there would be an age limit as to when certain rights come into place, you know, I mean, would that be a real problem, I suppose, in terms of the individuals involved? Maybe Professor O'Shea, O'Shea might come back on that. So, um, so I suppose I'll start from whoever wants to indicate now, uh, Sarah. Yeah. Just pick, um, for, first of all, obviously any legislation is progress, because presently we've had none. Um, and as I stated earlier, I mean, Lydia Foy asked 20 years ago uh, for this change. So any, you know, as we said, and a number of people have said here today, that it's, it's very, very welcome that we're at this process, at this point in the process. Um, However, I think that while, while it is progress, there are still lots of problems. And I, I go back to what I said in my speech or my statement was that there are a lot of these issues speak to the everyday lives that we have to live. And I think the problems that, um, that are in the legislation as it's proposed at the presently would still continue to cause day-to-day -day problems for trans individuals and also trans children. Um, in relation to the age thing, I think one of the problems we have is, is that, that we need to remember is that at the age of 16, an individual can actually access medical treatment of their own volition without any parental consent. And if they therefore access this particular medical treatment, they are then left in a limbo where they have changed physically their, their bodies and are not physically recognised. And I mean, I deal with, uh, I facilitate the Trans Peer Support Group in Dublin, and we have many young people that come there regularly, and we've had all sorts of situations. Um, I've, I've reported a story previously where the passport office refused a young man because they didn't feel he was in transition long enough. And yet he was clearly masculine. If I stood him in front of you here today, nobody would recognise that he was even trans. And I think the problem there is, is that... It, Sometimes these hormone treatments make very, very quick changes and therefore physically uh, people will have the problem going to school, physically looking male or female and not being recognised for that fact within, say, the education system, which is a major problem. Um, so yes, I think from a progressive point of view, I think the legislation is definitely a ne the next step, but I think I would e again echo Brendan Griffin's uh, uh, comments about that, and I think many other people said it, it needs to be a process. I think it was Aidan Reardon said the same. It needs to be a process. This needs to be uh, fixed and adjusted. And I think it's crucial that the age situation is identified because I know I knew when I was five, and I know lots of people do. And you waiting till 18 is a problem, you know. Okay. Um, I, I just would like to say that, um, you know, when when my son first came to us and said he was transgender, it was a huge shock, and we didn't expect to be there at all. I never... This happens on Oprah. This doesn't happen to me. But I thought my son had a problem with mental health because he was down, depressed, withdrawn, and I see that since we have accepted it as a family, the difference that that has made in his demeanour and the confidence he's doing well at school. So imagine if the state could recognise him, you know, and value him, what the difference that would make, say, to career choices he makes. And, you know, he feels valued. If you don't feel valued, you won't do well. And I just feel that, especially between 16 and 18, the choices that you make and the, the name and gender goes on to documents that follow you through for the rest of your life. Do you really want to be keeping having to explain why you look like a man, you have a man's name, 
but your gender says female, you know, you, you, it's going to follow you through. I would like transgen transgender to be just in the past for my son, that he just becomes the man he's meant to be and we forget about it and we just get on with it. But if, the, if, he, if he has to wait till he's 18, there's going to be documents that will have his gender on and will just continue to follow him. So for me, I think it's, a, I think it's an important part in anybody's life, but particularly when you're transgender, that is a really important stage in your life. Okay. Okay. Any, anyone else? Yeah, just in response to the question about progress, um, indeed, I don't think any of us are, feel that bringing in a legislation would not be progress. Um, particularly within Europe, we are one of the very last countries to bring this in, so of course it's progress to bring it in, but I think, again, within Europe, uh, What's being proposed here is more in line with some of the countries that brought in this type of legislation in the 70s and 80s. So do we really want to bring in something that already we know from this stage is that outdated? Um, and certainly in relation to the Gender Recognition Advisory Group proposals, what's come down in this heads of bill is progress from that as well. I think the difficulty is that medical professionals have been listened to, it seems, equally to transgender people, or if not more than transgender people. And I'll reiterate that it, it is a legal process and it's not a medical process. I think, I think the HSE pathway for trans people and for trans care is certainly something that needs to be looked at. And I think that that's probably a job for an entirely separate committee and an entirely separate process. But, it, but I don't think any of us is disputing that that needs some attention. Um, and I guess I would just ask you, what's the harm What's the harm in reducing the age so that young people can have their gender recognized and be protected? What's the harm in allowing what is realistically a very tiny minority within a minority of people to remain in their marriages? It, it won't hurt anyone else to let these families stay families and to simultaneously recognize the gender identities of the trans partner. And what's the harm in allowing someone to self-determine their identity without the need of a stamp of approval from the Department of Social Protection or a letter from a doctor? Anyone can get married. Anyone can get a passport. This is a legal process, and it's something that should be afforded to anyone, regardless of mental health status, regardless of marital status, um, regardless of age. It's, it, it's a basic human right. I mean, this, this process wasn't instigated from within Ireland. This came down from Europe. We're one of the last countries to implement this. So while it's been great that John Burton has brought this process forward, it, it came down from higher up. And we're, we're quite literally one of the last in Europe that's being dragged along here. So I'll ask, what's the harm in bringing it in? in a more inclusive and respectful way that protects people, and then also consider what's the harm if we don't. And I think that, that, that we've seen here today the harm that could be done to young people if they're not unable to get their gender recognized, to married families if they're forced to divorce, um, and to anyone who's forced to go through a medical process that they may not be able to do or they may not wish to do. Thanks. Andy, did you, yeah. um, on the topic of waiting until you're 18 because they're going to be 18 anyway, I think that's personally I think that's ridiculous because um, they're not they're they're yeah they are going to be 18 but they're not 18 now and they they're still they still are trans, um, and like you spend five or six years in secondary school and imagine every single day you're there you're forced to wear the wrong uniform for example, and having something as simple to be able to say to the um, the board or whatever of that school say, oh, look, my legal gender is male, let me wear the correct uniform. Like something as simple as that, that's one reason why um, young people need to be recognised in this legislation. Um, like um, I have very close friends, including myself, I've dropped out of school and I have very close friends who've also dropped out of school and college because of how difficult it is to go through that process, not being able to have your legal gender recognised. And I think... Um, having the correct foundation in life is just as important like as anything else within life if you can't start off properly like what is the rest of your life going to be and that's why it needs that's why it's so important to include young people and it's not a discussion about whether um like the, the issue of informed consent in relation to medical um 
operations, etc., is, is a completely separate issue. This is a legal thing. This is about um, being able to change your gender marker, etc., just like you're able to change your name by deed pool, and it should be as equally as simple process. And um, parents do that for their children all the time, change their name, whether it's through um, a parent getting remarried, etc. Like it's it's a common process, and this should be just as equally as simple. So I think. And what age would, would you put? A, what age would you put in the le legislation, or would you put an age? Um, well, I think age of 16 for your own like informed consent, and then below that, parental um, advisory or parental garden advisory. Okay, Professor Arshay. Um, the I suppose just a couple of the the age I will repeat the medical important age and the important age of real distress to the individuals is uh, puberty, which is well before 16, and uh, the 16, 18 is a facile constitutional argument, and inclusion would suggest it's it's changed. That's unanimous around the contributions from the questions. Practically, well, we haven't heard from Deputy O'Brien yet, but. Uh, and I presume that's part of the process, that this will feed back to uh, the, the heads of bill. So, I mean, the age thing, I don't particularly want to get involved with beyond that. Uh, Deputy O'Reardon has left. Um, the sporting organisations um, all have to have a position on this. Uh, and I have been involved in the International Rugby Board Committee on uh, gender uh, dysphoria. Uh, in the year running up to the Women's uh, Rugby World Cup, uh, where there were significant concerns about uh, patient, individuals who transitioned, uh, now representing from the uh, female to male, uh, no, from the male to female role, uh, running out as six foot ten second rows on uh, international teams. And uh, the sporting organisations are agitated about this. They need to have a position on it. And then I suppose what this uh, heads of bill is addressing is whether that should have be a constitutional entitlement for the sporting boards or just left up to the sporting boards, I guess. But it's a real issue. Uh, in a, uh, and it relates to um, a position they have to have on the intersex conditions as well as the uh, gender dysphoria. The constitutional point of view on validation um, and, and uh, the validation process uh, really shouldn't be, I think, a process. I think it should be uh, a supporting statement from the practitioner who is uh, is been or has been involved with looking after them uh, through uh, some point of their uh, journey. Uh, we have 254 patients, or 246, attended us in, in, in Lachlanstown. Uh, we would have been asked to see many more, many more than that, or not many more, but a, a certain number more than that, who, who don't have the condition, who have what uh, you mentioned, well, maybe it's a mental problem, uh, you know, they're down, they're depressed, but personality disorder, which is totally different from gender dysphoria, uh, can have a focus on gender as an issue. And an individual uh, with a personality disorder could choose to change their gender uh, by simply self-declaring. Um, and I suppose the issue for the committee is, is in terms of the birth cert, whether, uh, you know, that's a minority risk, uh, but uh, it's the constitutionality of that uh, document. There will be regret, uh, and that rate is very small in the gender dysphoria community who go through transition, and there is the capacity to change back within this legislation. So, um, but a process, uh, an examination, a board that you have to sit in front of is not uh, what I would uh, imagine. Um, and then, you know, I suppose your opening question passed, well, if this legislation were to be passed, well, of course it would, you know, represent progress, but there are clear appetite for change, some changes. Okay, okay. Um, thanks, Donald. Um, Simonetta, yeah. Uh, Chair, there were a number of things I wanted to come back on. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, just to say um, that 
the uh, changing somebody's birth certificate is not an insignificant issue from the point of view of state records. Now, people can actually, as it stands, already have the, a passport in their changed gender, but there is a requirement that they have to be in the new gender for a couple of years. Um, but you can see that it is important in, in other realms, you know, in terms of uh, criminal activity or whatever, that it is important that the state knows who's who. So I think that's just a kind of practical issue that, you know, we can't just ignore. So it's not quite the same, I don't think, as a marriage certificate. Um, in relation to marriage and the whole constitutional issue there, I mean, clearly that I, I did say earlier, I mean, I can't talk about our legal advice on that, and I'm not going to, but there are differing views as to um, the, the impact on the constitution of whether you inadvertently create a same-sex marriage or whether you don't. And there, I mean, I can say quite clearly there certainly isn't agreement on that, and I don't think that's going to come as a surprise to anybody. Um, so, in a sense, that's the kind of horns of a, of, of a dilemma that we face in drafting this legislation. And I should say again that the broader issues around that really are for um, the Department of Justice and, and uh, Equality. Um, on sport, I think I, I said when I was talking that there are a number of pieces in this legislation that to some extent are fail-safe provisions and um, are looking, you know, have been imported in from other legislation. And the sport one is there and what uh, Professor O'Shea says is correct. There are issues for sporting bodies. But I think that the Minister will be listening very closely to obviously everything that the committee has to say in its recommendations, including on in relation uh, to that one. Um, uh, Deputy Griffin said, um, was it possible to revoke the decision? And that is possible under the legislation, and that, that will be possible. Um, I think it is also important to say that, in one sense, you know, it's, we're not forcing people to, to divorce. We're just, we are requiring them to, to be single, and there is a kind of a subtle distinction. And we do have in our legislation, in our constitution, as everybody is aware, very specific criteria around divorce and the amount of time that people have to live apart. And that's just a simple fact that we, we can't ignore. And I also am aware of the, of the European issues. And I think it is important to say that um, what we are proposing here is well in line with our European um, member states. In fact, no other member state that I am aware of has uh, legislation at the moment that is below uh, 18. Um, I know that in the Netherlands they are looking at 16, but they haven't been successful in actually getting that legislation enacted. I think that's a factual position. Um, so I, I do want to say again as well that the validation process, we do see it as light touch. There is no requirement for the minister or the department to be told whether the person has had any interventions whatsoever. The care pathway is a matter for, for them um, and, and, and their, their physician. Um, so I think, I hope I have covered the issues that I have been asked. Um, if I have left anything out, maybe. Would, uh, Deputy O'Sandig and then Deputy Griffin. There's a number of issues, and kind of I, I was told to keep my first comments brief, so I, I, I kept a few questions back. Um, has there been a count taken of Austria's uh, decision, um, which saw that uh, there couldn't be a, a requirement to divorce, or that, uh, and I think Germany followed suit 2006, 2008. You know, has that been taken into account? And that might be what you were saying that there's different views. Uh, uh, as to how to address that, but that's, they wouldn't be seen as the most progressive in terms of this type of legislation in any shape or form yet. Kind of people had to go to the court to try and uh, ensure that the legislation um, which, which gave recognition uh, didn't force divorce or um, a, a split in partnership. The other question is, from the time of application to the time of granting of certificate, what do you expect the, the, the time frame to be? You know, will, will, will there be will it be immediate once all of the, the, the three or four criteria that's mentioned in the heads are satisfied, or will there be uh, d delays? You know, certain certain time frames to allow for um, the department to look at it because at the moment, for instance, like nat uh, naturalisation takes six to seven years. In this country, from from application, so you know, do you do you expect that that type of time frame, or it will it be more instantaneous? Um, the, something that, as people were talking, we're talking about, say, on, on those over 18 in the legislation, and kind of discussion here was to move that to 16. 
Um, does this legislation, or has it been considered that parents can apply um, to have gender recognition um, uh, changed, kind of in incidents where either it's medically obvious, um, or kind of in the case, uh, so for instance, intersex or indeterminate sexes, because uh, I, just from a quick reading again, because it's just something I hadn't taken note of, um, it doesn't seem that in that case, so are, are you then condemning uh, a child who has had a diagnosis at birth of being male to wait until they're 18, despite the fact kind of that they are obviously female from an early age? You know, it, is that covered? in this legislation um, and kind of, it, we, we've concentrated uh, and, and I thank the representative here on the specifics in the bill kind of, and we haven't heard in, in some ways bar Andy there the personal testimony you know, just how urgent this is for people who are stuck in a situation kind of, where the state isn't recognising them I've, I've, I've heard those testimony myself and it's a pity I know we're dealing with legislation, but it's a pity that people outside don't hear it, because this is quite a complex issue kind of to grapple with. Uh, you're, you're dealing with quite a range of concepts, kind of the, me the medical issues that uh, Professor O'Shea has meant. Kind of we're dealing with legislation, but then for the individual, there will be every single individual case will be different in their own ways, and trying to capture them all in legislation is hard, and I think kind of we've made major progress from where I thought uh, the, the, the government were going, or, or, or the department were going in the past, and, it, and I welcome that. All I'm trying to do is to try and ensure that whatever comes out at the end of this is the best possible, and that we've learned from all of the other jurisdictions around the world who have also grappled with the same questions we have, and they've come out in, in, in different ways, and that we, 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 we can set a standard to our legislation that others will follow rather than us kind of uh, ignoring the mistakes others made and repeating them in, in the legislation. So, some, some have been learned, others I think haven't. Okay, thanks, uh, Jeffrey Griffin. Yeah, just on the further there to the and, and the issue of um, uh, requirement to, to divorce and the divorce issue. Um, my understanding is surely that the the issue should the the, the focus should be on the fact that uh, under current law and under the constitution that its marriage is entered into between between a man and a woman so that it actually shouldn't be um that, that it's upon entry into the marriage is the, is, is the question so that therefore there shouldn't be a requirement for uh, d divorce um, in, in such uh, circumstances as, as, as we're uh, discussing here and also um, just <coughs> on the issue of, of age uh, and I take as well what was said in relation to putting an age on it as opposed to the actual circumstances of the individual um, if the concern is that a person uh, may not be mature enough to make that decision um, uh, or, or that you know their, their parents uh, may not be making the correct decision on their behalf. Um, again, is, isn't the fact that it can be reversed? Isn't that the safety net that we need here? And um, surely that should be um, enough to to um, to allow not having to put the 18 limit uh, in the legislation. Okay, um, maybe Simonetta first, and then if anyone else. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just on the time frame, Deputy Snoddy, I think that we would expect the time frame to be quick. Um, obviously, we'll, there will be a backlog of people to be dealt with, um, but it will be dealt with within our department, and we're not looking at huge numbers, so we'll be looking at the sort of thing you're talking about. Um, in relation to the Austria and Austria and the German experience, I mean they have just a completely different constitution to us. So I think you know we're back to the difficulties around our the very specific constitutional issues that we have in Ireland. Um, I think that there is a question, you, you also asked a question about where it is medically obvious that there has been a, um, a miss, a, a miss um, I can't think of the word, uh, where somebody has been categorised in the wrong gender um, at birth. I think that there is already provision in the 2004 Act to, for the correction of errors. I think what this, um, by the Registrar General, who may elaborate on this in a moment, but I think in addition to that, what this um, piece of legislation will do, it'll, it's, you know, it'll provide a further um, remedy in, in that case. 
Um, Deputy Griffin uh, then also talked again about the marriage issue, and I think all I can say there is that my understanding is that it is not an accepted fact amongst lawyers that um, where people enter into a marriage as one, uh, you know, as a man and woman, and then the, the uh, gender of one of those people changes, that, that does not affect the position of the marriage. I mean, that's my understanding, that that is not a, an accepted fact, it's a view. Um, I think that to say yes, you can. There is a provision in the legislation to revoke and to, to reverse um, the gender uh, change. But I, I understand, and I, from talking to people and from people's uh, what people are saying here, that that in itself would be a huge decision uh, for people. And I think to you know it would be reckless almost to use that as a kind of a remedy. I would have thought. Um, I don't know if the Registrar, Kieran Feely, if you want to comment, Kieran, on the correction of errors. Yes, um, <coughs> just I suppose um, I should also address the question um, raised by Deputy Osnoddy in relation to the timescale. Um, I would envisage uh, that once the gender recognition certificate arrives in the General Register Office, that the registration would be done within a matter of days and that a certificate would issue to the person. Um, <coughs> that would um, depend on agreement. Um, or the agreement of the person that the particulars to be recorded in the register are, are correct and that there is no question or dispute about them, you know. Um, in relation to intersex conditions, um, as, as Ms Ryan has pointed out, there is um, there are provisions in the Civil Registration Act 2004 for the correction of errors uh, in registers. Uh, so there is nothing wrong with or, or there's nothing to prevent a person uh, or a parent of a person affected by an intersex condition to apply for the correction of an error in the gender indicator uh, in the entry in the register of births. Okay, um, and Sarah? Sorry, can I just uh, pick up on a couple yeah. of points there? Yeah. Um, f first of all, um, in relation to the children, the age situation, um, Ms Ryan mentioned about no other uh, European countries being um, considering the age, first of all, I'd like to point out that uh, Boat Malta, first of all, has actually considered that uh, and does actually include in their legislation under 18, but also that Holland or the Netherlands are presently proposing to change their legislation to read, uh, to, to include under 18 um, uh, children. Secondly, can I ask a question, if you don't mind, of, of actually the department um, in relation to the... Um, um, the uh, physician's letter. Do, how does the department uh, intend to deal with the fact that there are very few um, experts dealing with this uh, issue in Ireland presently and therefore um, we would be basically back to a very small number of people who could actually sign this letter off because I know, you know from our own experience and I think Dr O'Shea could maybe uh, agree with this is that even when we're trying to get um, you know signed off for surgeries it, obviously it's you're quite uh, overloaded with work a lot of the time and therefore we have struggled constantly to try and continually get you know access to try and uh, to funding etc or to referrals and um, so w when we get to the point of actually looking for this letter well the registrar general may say it may take a few days it may actually take a lot longer to actually get the letter Letter from who? From the letter from the physician or the attaining physician. Yeah, like the, 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 within the within the legislation, it says that it's. I think the uh, department has said that they they recommend that it would be um, endocrinologists, psychiatrists, or paediatricians. There is less than a handful of endocrinologists, psychiatrists, and paediatricians dealing with this issue in Ireland. Okay, I mean that would probably. I don't think that would be in the competence of the Department of Social Protection probably to answer that now. Uh, I, I, I can go back uh, in a minute. But uh, Le Leslie, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, just a couple of points I'd like to pick up on. Um, again, I feel that that the marriage contract and the marital legal right is a very useful comparison for this. Um, in terms of the medical diagnosis I'm just, or the medical assertion, I'm just gonna go back to the fact that the very small number of medical people in this field have a, have a vested interest in keeping this in the legislation for their own business and for their own income. Um, 
bringing up the issue of personality disorder or mental illness, I really feel is irrelevant. Um, any old crazy person can enter into a marriage and any, any person should be able to enter into a gender identity recognition of their gender identity. I, it shouldn't matter what type of mental illness state the person is in or not in. Um, and I think that it's a useful comparison as well in terms of the reversal and the fact that we can have divorce and divorce was brought into Ireland quite late, I might add, but with good reason. And having that, um, as Brendan Griffin stated, that implemented into the, the legislation, I, it's not reckless, it's reality. Um, and what's the problem with that? Um, in terms of sport, I just want to say that, yes, it, it is an issue that probably perhaps will need to be addressed, I suppose, I don't think by this um, committee, but I would urge you to look at the, at the viewpoint of protecting trans people as opposed to further stigmatizing and oppressing. Um, and then just lastly, in, in relation to the constitutional issues and the comparison between Austria and Germany, um, I would imagine it's quite difficult for any members of this committee and indeed for us as activists to make comparisons to those other countries without a firm legal opinion and interpretation of the constitution and I, I, I think it's very challenging for anybody to make a decision in relation to this divorce point when we don't have a firm interpretation and legal opinion on the constitutionality of the forced divorce. Thanks. Um, okay, uh, Simonetta, do you have any comments about the question that uh, Sarah is Oster, do you, do, would you have any comment? Uh, well, just to say my understanding, but again, you're correct, it yeah. isn't particularly my area of competence that there are a number of practitioners and a growing number of practitioners in the field. And just to say again that all that will be required of them is, is uh, you know, a short document. It's not a, it does not require um, a whole lot of backup information or anything like that. So it's, it's much more, more straightforward. Um, and I think the other point when I, what, where I was talking about the uh, reversal uh, I, I'm not saying that reversal itself is reckless, I mean, far be it for me to say that. What I'm saying is that you could, I wouldn't say that it would be reasonable to rely on that to advance the issue around age, whatever your view may be around the issue around age. Pick up on that, uh, the point I was making on that as well was that uh, I'm acknowledging that no, nobody would enter into, into this lightly, but what I'm saying is in terms of in the law, it would be a fair balancing um, provision to have um, in, in, in terms of um, if, we, if, we, if we're justifying not having the 18 limit there, well, you can justify it by the fact that you, you have that provision there where it is reversible. Uh, so, you know, uh, so rather than, uh, it would be very different and I would have serious um, concerns if, if there wasn't an opportunity to reverse this, um, then I would have uh, serious issues about a minor uh, entering into such an important decision. But the fact that it's there, surely that justifies um, the, the re removal of the age limit. And that's, from a law point of view, that, that makes it fair and reasonable is the point I'm making. Okay, um, Donal. Uh, just on, on the issue of um, the access to health care, um, briefly, uh, there are an increasing number of endocrinologists um, within the HSE system uh, seeing and dealing with this condition. Uh, I have always uh, tried to keep it exclusively within the public system, so I would never have taken, uh, you know, if you like, private income, the, accu the if you like, accusation of vested interest. I very much think that conditions like this need to be managed in the public system they, so they can be referred on through the public system for the treatment abroad scheme. Uh, I think within the private system, this is extremely, uh, would be extremely expensive. Uh, I've encouraged other healthcare specialists who've trained with us to do the same. It's a, it's a, it's a small uh, volume workload. Um, uh, so I think, uh, you know, you, it, it could be, uh, you know, when the specialists have been identified, it's a regulated specialist uh, subject to medical counsel uh, sanction if they are exploiting or seen to be uh, vested in their interests. Okay. 
Right. Um, okay. Well, I think I'm going to conclude because we have uh, further hearings uh, tomorrow, and I just want to thank thank everybody. Um, I mean, if there's any points that you feel weren't, you know, that you didn't get an opportunity, you can correspond with the committee. You know, following the meeting, in terms of just to provide any additional information or clarification that you want to provide. And as you know, we'll have meetings. Uh, we have a further hearings tomorrow, uh, in which we have a further six witnesses, and uh, it starts at ten. Okay. All right. So thanks very much. And the meeting is adjourned till tomorrow at 10.